All right, uh, I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the select board uh, open. Um, first item on the agenda is to review and approve the meeting, meeting minutes from January 19th. Uh, are there any comments on those, Fred? No, nope. move to okay. approve. Um, I would second that. Um, uh, okay, all in favor, Fred? Yes. Me? Yes. Okay. Uh, the second item is the vendor and payroll warrants. I moved through those. John has signed them. Do you have any comments or anything to say about those, Fred? The only thing I have to say is thank you to whoever figured out how to do them in portrait instead of landscape. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, great. Uh, then we don't need to take a vote on that. Uh, public comment. Uh, so now is the time to hear from the public on items that are not listed on the agenda. Is there anyone who um, wants to say anything? Okay, I don't see anybody trying to raise their hands or uh, I don't see anybody like mouthing words and they're muted or something like that. So I'm gonna take that to be at the moment, there's no public comment. Okay, we are two minutes ahead of schedule. I like that. But our first scheduled appointment um, uh, is to uh, nominally for the purpose to appoint Seamus, the position of comfort dog with the Waitley Police Department. Honestly, I didn't even know this was something we had the power to do. So you learn something new every day in this job, even if you've been doing it for a while. Um, I took it to mean that in our packet, there was a policy and is it the case that we want to, we already have this policy or we want to vote to take, accept this policy and then appoint Seamus? That was, I guess, my main question about procedure about this one. Do you want me to handle that, Brian? Sure. So the, the policy itself, <clears throat> it's a, um, I'm, I'm sure there's other policies out there. This is a kind of a standard standard policy that came up for uh, for Massachusetts. A few departments have been using this. I made some modifications to make it make it suit our needs. Um, <clears throat> as far as the the policy goes, um, I submit the policy. If you guys don't have an issue with the policy, then it goes into effect. I don't think there's really a, a vote that needs to take place. I mean, if there was issues and you wanted something to change in the policy, we could discuss that, but I don't think it requires an actual, an actual vote. So the policy was more the formality side, just to show you kind of what the use is going to be from the police perspective, and that this just wasn't just me bringing my dog to work, that this is actually something that we're, a program that we're looking at implementing. So um, hopefully it, it gave a, a good enough description in the, in the policy as to what we're going to what we're going to be doing um, with the dog. There's a couple of couple of things because it is a a I don't want to say a generic policy, but it's a more of an mm -hmm. all-encompassing policy. So if this if this was a, a town-owned dog, so if this was mm -hmm. either donated to the town or the town purchased the dog to be used as a, in, a, in a program like this, um, there's a section of the policy that covers what the town mm -hmm. is responsible for. Um, there's also a section if it's a privately owned dog, which this one is, it's, it's my dog. We're going to be using it for this. So, um, it explains everything else, the expenses, the care for the dog feeding, all that stuff. Um, and that it kind of alleviates the town from any of those expenses, unless there's something moving forward in the future, if it's a successful program and, you know, we work something into the budget <clears throat> at that time, we can, we can discuss it, or if there's donations or anything that come up to help offset any costs. Um, we could address that issue as well. But so I just want to let you know that the policy covered both. Um, mm. So we're, we're in a situation where this is a privately owned dog. So I'm assuming the care for the dog, um, taking the dog to the vet, feeding it, doing everything that, that's required. The training for the dog that we're going through right now is donated by the place where we got the dog from. <clears throat> They're donating the training. It's 26 total weeks. It's broken up into different segments. We're in the first six week segment right now. Um, so it'll be 26 weeks total before he's completed the, the training. It's usually, it usually takes about um, a year before they're like fully, um, mm -hmm. fully enrolled in you know, the, 
program. Oh, okay. But up until that point, I mean, he's still currently. I've been bringing him to bringing him to work with me, taking him to the town offices, taking him around because part of the first part of the training is um, the socialization, whether it's with people, whether it's with other animals, or it's different environments. Uh, like today, we went to the the town hall, went in the elevator, went up the stairs, just different surfaces, different noises, things like that, just to get them acclimated to all of that stuff. Um, so that's kind mm -hmm. of the first step in the training process is to, to work through all that before we really roll them out. I mean, right now, if we were to get a, a crisis type of call, he, he wouldn't be ready to, to respond mm -hmm. to that. I mean, he'd probably be with me, but um, wouldn't, mm -hmm. wouldn't really be serving uh, a huge purpose at this point because we haven't completed the training. But, but maybe a year from now, that would not be the case. You might actually have the dog all trained. Correct. But this that's, is sort of a probationary appointment. appointment to Seamus, who's not fully trained. So uh, yes. they would they would be uh, you know on probation until they get really trained. Yeah, and it's it's more of a I I don't know the the legality behind it. Maybe Brian Brian knows more. But from my perspective, I was thinking more of a ceremonial kind of mm -hmm. appointment as opposed to like something legally official like mm. if the town appoints him now the town's responsible for something that's not what i'm looking at i was just kind of looking at it as more of a a fun thing so we could call him officer Seamus or something like that and, you know, mm -hmm. school. they're already calling him that so <laughs> well that was my that was my plan with it anyways no do you have anything you want to ask or add fred no no just you know there's seems to be no financial impact at this time but if the program if Seamus works out and the program continues there we have no problem considering a line item in the police budget to cover it yeah okay um but is this something we need to vote on then if it's i don't know how official this is um, do we need to see Seamus? Now. Could the, could yeah. the, you know the public? He's see hiding Seamus? under my desk, so I'm trying to get him out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's not very comfortable at the moment. There he is. He's little so right looks now. Looks like a maybe a poodle or a mix with a poodle or something. He's a st standard poodle. Uh huh. Right now he's he's currently 32 pounds, but he just turned five months old, so he's got still got some growing to do. He'll probably okay. be in the 60 pound range. He'll double in size from what he is now. Okay. You know, okay. He, he doesn't get the concept of the video thing, but. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> but he has met he has met a lot of people in town. He's been to the fire department. He's met the highway guys, the fire firefighters, town office people. He's he's met mm. all of his uh, fellow employees. All right. Well, <clears throat> um, then I would I'd entertain a motion regarding this. Uh, this ceremonial appointment. I move that we appoint Seamus as town comfort dog provisionally until he gets his certification. I'll second that. Uh, all in favor, Fred? Yes. Joyce, yes. All right, Seamus, get to work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. He's okay. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. Let me get back to the um, the agenda window here. Okay, next item on the agenda, uh, we were going to hear from Susan Barron and Keith Bardwell, uh, to give us an update on what's going on with the 250th anniversary celebration events and activities. So I can turn the floor over to I'll Susan I'll... or Keith or both. You Go can. Ahead, Susan. I'll start. Okay, Keith. Uh, first of all, several people on. If you're in little Zoom windows on the screen are part of the committee. So if there's anything that I skip over or anything anyone wants to mention, please do so. Plans are coming along very nicely for our celebration. The dates of the celebration are, it begins on Friday evening, June 17th of this year, and it runs through Sunday the 26th. And there are activities planned for every day of that time frame. We've got several concerts planned. We have health the night, thanks to the uh, police. We have parade and fireworks and a chicken barbecue, thanks to the fire department. 
an arts and crafts show, um, family day, all sorts of events are scheduled for that week. I don't know if you want me to go through the specific schedule. Our intention is to have an insert in the upcoming edition of the scoop that would give more information to the public so they can start marking their calendars, saving dates for things they want to participate in. We also have begun fundraising among businesses in the community and have started seeing some returns for that. We have received funds from Yankee Candle, no, from Fairview Farms. We have a commitment from Yankee Candle, commitment from Muffins, um, a couple other small businesses, the names are escaping me. And we're continuing to pursue that because as you may remember, over the course of three budget years, the town committed up to $60,000 towards this, but the understanding was if we can raise money through fundraising, we would return any unused money back to the, to the town. So we're, we would like to continue to fundraise. And part of what we're doing with the fundraising is giving businesses the opportunity to sponsor, to be the main sponsor of specific events. So you know, for example, uh, Yankee Candle has said that they want to be the main sponsor of the chicken barbecue. Um, as we approach other businesses, we're hoping that we can get them to pick an event that they, that they want to be associated with. Keith, what am I forgetting? The other thing that I'd like to just interject is um, we'll be definitely coming to the board when we know the exact specifics, but looking for one day liquor licenses or however you want it, we would want to handle it. Um, there'll be, at the moment, there's three events, the fireman's muster, the chicken barbecue and the polka are the events that we would be looking at a liquor license for those days. Um, other than that, I know I've talked with, <clears throat> with Brian in the past in regards to um, insurance questions and he has told us that it, it, it's covered under our umbrella for our events because this is a town sponsored event. So, you know, we're good there. Um, Potentially, I'm also thinking and considering that, you know, when it gets closer, we may, um, like an example, um, may want the highway department to help out in some aspects of moving, um, let's say, signs or horses or things like that where we might need to do for traffic stuff. Um, nothing, I don't see anything major that would be requested of like town town staff but just incidental things where you know the equipment that the town has already in regards to like signage and things like that message boards the message boards we have you know moving the, that kind of stuff around um maybe need to be done during town town time things of that nature also um even maybe some of the infrastructure as far as you know picking up trash a day after or something of that nature is a possibility but other than that um that's i think susan covered the rest of all of our events pretty well in regards to what we're planning well, one thing i thought of that we hadn't mentioned was committing what to give a gift to the to the future residents of the town and we are, we've been working with the library board because it, what we did would be on library property where we're intending to have a granite bench that will have the 250 logo, um, our slogan, which is our one and only Waitley and the date. And we're thinking with a granite bench, that's something that you know, hopefully 100 years from now, people will look at it and say, wow, people were here back in 2021, 22. The other thing that we're working on is a panorama, <clears throat> excuse me, to also go behind the library because we know a lot of the cyclists and walkers and visitors to the town love the view behind the library. So Allison Bell is working on putting together a uh, panorama that 
people could look at while enjoying the view so that they know what they're looking at. They, it would, would indicate different things in the view. So those would be our gifts to the town. And we are not using town or state money for that. That's coming from donations. Okay. That, that's it unless the other members of the committee who happen to be on this call have anything yeah. they want. I would just say, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to okay. say, open up the floor to anybody who wants to uh, to ask or comment. For details, people can go to the Waitley 250 website or Facebook page that have more of the details of what's been planned. Mm -hmm. Or join the Facebook group. Uh, doing we're doing some uh, fundraising ideas that we've got going on and some souvenir sales, which as they come online, will go through the website and the Facebook page. Uh, and just say that I haven't been involved with it. Fundraising, COVID has made fundraising for this very difficult. When to, to fundraise for a prospective event before there's any schedule or knowing what will occur is, has been a challenge. Yeah. Dee, do you have anything to add? You're okay. mute. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward to seeing the, the uh, insert for the scoop. I think that's going to help get things on people's calendars now that the, the schedule is kind of starting to gel. So, so very good. Um, if there's, if nobody else has any more questions or comments on that. I say, oh, Jim, would you raise your hand there? I just had <clears throat> just had a question if, if the locations for these events are already set in stone. Do we know where they're all going to take place? Are they all one location? Are they around town, different places? Or <clears throat> more, more or less, the, um, the biggest venues are going to be, you know, like tent at the fire station. That'll be for the polka and the chicken barbecue. Hurley He Park will be family day, that type of thing. Then there's going to be certainly a day up at the library for the time capsule. Um, that's where the fireworks will take place behind the library. Uh, those are the biggest things. Other than that, the smaller venues are going to be um, the town hall for concerts. Um, Joyce, are you using the chapel at all? Or I think uh, they're going to be big enough that we'll, we'll need the town hall. Uh, and the other thing at town hall will be the the uh, arts and crafts. Correct. I just wanted to make sure that you know for the larger events that like the fireworks, if there's going to be lots of people and traffic and that kind of stuff and the darkness, that we want to make sure we have um, police officers on duty that we staff up for those events. <clears throat> yeah, there, there there will be the parade that will have to be staffed up for. Yeah, that, that I've been working with John on. I just want to make okay. sure with the other events that if those are set in stone, we can figure um, if it's going to be that whole week, you know, we're, we're going to have to mm. work on getting getting people there because we have limited staff anyways. So I don't know that I'll get everybody there every day, but mm. we want to definitely have some people for the bigger events. If you'd like, we can go over the more detailed calendar with you at some point. Yeah, I'm oh, sure. And with events, we think um, we will most need your help. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you can do that. Okay. All right. I think it's, it sounds like we've kind of um, come to the end of this. Thank you so much, Susan and Keith, for um giving us that great summary and letting people know about it because you know people people do watch this <laughs> um and uh, and occasionally some of the things we do make it into the newspapers even so great thank you so much thank you thank you all right um well the next scheduled appointment's not till seven so let's move on to the other items in the agenda um I've got uh, under uh, COVID-19 to review the existing 
COVID-19 policies. And I did not see a suggestion for a new policy in the packet. So maybe I'll hand over to Brian and let him uh, update yeah, us. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so this is just the, the recurring item that we have on the agenda. Um, and I just wanted to uh, sort of take the temperature of the board. Um, I was thinking about reaching out to the Board of Health and I mean, there's a lot in the news right now about restrictions being lifted through K through 12. Uh, New York State is lifting their indoor mask mandate. Some municipalities in Massachusetts are doing the same. Um, and I just want to get a sense of what their thoughts are for, um, uh, I guess, de-escalating some of these restrictions and when it would be appropriate. Um, I mean, right now, I think the only mask requirement that's in town is, is on town buildings. I don't think there was ever a, I don't think the Board of Health ever expanded it to um, other places. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and then obviously the conversations about in-person meetings. And I think this all sort of, you know, it, it, it comes along the lines of sort of how do we move forward with sort of the, the current status of, of, of where we are with the virus and things like that. So um, if, if, so I think I'll reach out to the Board of Health unless, unless you guys think I shouldn't. Um, or have feelings otherwise about, you know, how do we sort of move forward um, mm -hmm. with the town offices, the town hall, um, and then sort of other town buildings mm -hmm. and then employees as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think we just do what we've been doing, first. which is take guidance from Board of Health and state guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that, that I wouldn't want to make a decision on anything without consulting the Board of Health. Um, the other thought that occurred to me while you were chatting was, I mean, one of the one of the things I think has actually been very nice that we've done during the pandemic time is move our town meeting to June and have it outdoors. And I think it'd be absolutely appropriate to plan for that this year. I think that's kind of where the schedule is, right? With the finance committee and so on, preparing budgets are, I don't think we're planning for an April town meeting at this point, right? Um, we could still hit an April meeting if we needed to. We could still hit an April meeting. Yeah. Um, we, we might wanna to avoid, um, I don't know, the the basically the uh, the June, I don't know, 17, 18, 19, up to like the 27, 28, 20, we might want to miss that time period, yeah. um, but sometime uh, earlier in June or, or late May or something. I, it's It has been really nice to be able to do that outdoors. I think we get, um, certainly it's more pleasant and um, I think people, people have really responded well to that. Um, and it may not be strictly speaking necessary uh, from a board of health point of view, but I, I just, it made me think of that. Um, and maybe maybe this is a good time to reach out to the Board of Health to to talk about some of those things you said. I, I'm not in a hurry necessarily to change things. I don't think we have particularly onerous requirements. Um, you know, it's masking in common places in the in the in our buildings, right? Yeah. And uh, as far as town meeting goes, I don't that's a good idea to continue to do it outside. But if restrictions loosen, we can then have a fallback of in the school mm. rather than have to go to a rain date. Mm. That's true. Fred, I missed, I missed the first part of that about, about the, the date. Um, you said your preference was for what? No, I, I didn't give a preference on the date. Oh. It doesn't. It's just that the we should just be able to you know follow again follow the guidelines, which at that point might allow us an indoor mm -hmm. town meeting, but use that as a uh, as a fallback in case of bad weather, rather than scheduling it for in, inside. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll I'll reach out to the Board of Health on 
on all of those things. And um, we can look at, at, I'll have some suggestions for town meeting dates if we want to try to have it outside for the next meeting. Brian, I, I've got a question for you regarding regular select board and other committee meetings. Where are we on the audiovisual equipment at town offices? Mm. Good question. Um, mm. We're pretty much all set. Uh, the one issue that we have left, and Joyce, we're, we're trying to figure this out, and I, I, it had slipped my mind after Me too. Um, we were here and we all did the install. But I we thought of it about a week ago, yeah. We couldn't figure out the output. This is going to be way down in the weeds, but for everybody else, we couldn't figure out why the output from the box wasn't working with the switcher. Right. Um, and we think... Hannah and Amy may have figured it out and we're going to have a conversation with someone from Wasman. Oh, um, so, um, right. We, it would work under some circumstances and not under others. And, and I, I left thinking we should call Wasman, but it sounds like cooler heads have prevailed and excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so we should be able to, we should be able to go live once that situation is, is figured out from the town offices. Um, everything else is operational and um, should, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really awesome actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's at first it's a little spooky cause the camera does all this moving for you. So if you're yeah. watching the screen, it hits, but, but it, it, it goes kind of, it fades into the background quickly. Anyways, that was, that was cool that day we were trying it out. W yeah. Will we need to have a, like a training session for various boards and committee? chairs to on how to mm. how to operate it i think that would be a very good idea hmm. yeah yeah it's it's not particularly difficult but i think uh, uh a run through would be a good idea yeah and l l learning on the fly during an actual meeting might not be the best idea <laughs> yeah yeah okay i see elena's here and this is the signal that maybe at some point our uh, state senator, state rep, may be on their way. Okay. Uh, oh, and I see Joe is here. Hi, Joe. Welcome. Hi. It's good to see you all. Elena is also here yeah. for my team. Yes, yes. I noticed Hi. Elena. Um, and uh, I don't see Natalie yet. We're just um, both coming from another meeting. Um, okay. We, we, it just just ended. Okay. So it won't be too, too. Is there anything that's really short here that we could take up? Oh, we could appoint the folks to the housing committee. I think that won't take long. Um, let's move to uh, new business item D. Um, uh, we have three people apparently willing to serve on the uh, housing committee. Brant Chiakis, I don't know if I pronounced that right, Natalie Borden, and Montserrat Archibald. Um, I understand that they're willing to serve, right? These are not people whose names were submitted randomly and they don't know about it. Okay. <laughs> well, I no. would move then that we appoint Brant, Natalie, and Montserrat to the Housing Committee. And um, I will gladly second before they change their minds. Okay. Uh, okay. Then all in favor, Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay, good. We've got that. Um, okay, I don't still don't see Natalie yet. Um, that's another short item we could do. I think the resource replacement fee is going to be pretty non-controversial. Um, would that be something we could probably do in just a few minutes? Yeah, I think so. I could um, happily weigh in on that. Okay, well, I'd like to turn it over to Hannah. That sounds great. I'm just pulling up the page right now. Um, so the uh, resource replacement fee uh, advisory committee was convened to kind of um, assist with, sorry, I'm still pulling up the sheet, um, to assist with coming up for a resource replacement fee for um, solar lands in solar development in Wheatley. Um, sorry, I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Um, 
Uh, so the committee was convened um, last last June. Um, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> You're going in the right direction. Yeah. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> okay, great. So um, the committee uh, was convened to uh, uh, come up with a um, select board regulation recommendation. Um, stating that the resource replacement fee shall be equal to the difference between the median market value per acre of all Waitley parcels in chapter 61 and 61A for that year as established by the Waitley Board of Assessors and the median value of those parcels per acre published by the Massachusetts Department of Revenue for chapter land for that fiscal year. The town assessor shall provide this calculation to the select board annually so that the fee may be reset. Acreage in a dual use solar facility meeting the Massachusetts smart siting guidelines as outlined in Massachusetts General Law 225. CMR shall be exempt from the fee. Um, Judy, if you would like to weigh in, um, we decided that uh, the fee should be, um, the recommended number that we have right now is the $4,129. Um, and that would be a one-time fee. We right. recommended this based on the, the fact that this is probably the most representative of the pool of the of the available parcels. And I think I should point out that the nice thing about these this fee is that it's based on two numbers on which uh, transactions are already taking place. It's easily updated. It, they're official numbers and they're meaningful for for what we're trying to do. So, committee was unanimous and pleased with the recommendation. Forgive me for interrupting friends. Um, Natalie is on a Deerfield Zoom. Um, is it okay with you if we come back at seven o'clock? Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Sure. Thank you. Yep. We're coming back at seven o'clock. I'm leaving. Okay. Um, thank you so See you much. All right. See you. Okay. Um, yeah, I was uh, the select board representative on the resource replacement committee. And um, I think this is the most sensible thing. We considered a lot of other things. A lot of other things would have been really harder to implement, a lot more work to implement than it would be worth. Um, and, you know, no structure is perfect and addresses every need, but this, um, it's something that uh, we can justify. Uh, and it does promote in the sense that there's no fee, uh, the dual use of farmland rather than converting farmland wholesale over to solar. And so, so the background on this for those who for those who might not know is that the, the zoning bylaw um, requires the, the payment of a resource replacement fee when land is taken out of is 61 and 61A, um, in a in a, a solar array is is constructed right, um, right. Yep. so the, there's a payment of a fee that's required by the zoning bylaw and the calculation of that fee was left to the um left to the select board to determine what it was the select board appointed an advisory working group to to make a recommendation as to how the fee would be calculated and that's this is the report of that working group um so that's what the, this is what the, the group has come up with, and that's the recommendation for uh, to the select board. Roughly, how many acres do we have in town that are subject to this? Oh, I think Judy. I'm sorry, might Fred, have I missed I missed that question. How how many acres in town will be subject to this fee? Uh, I can't answer that off the top of my head. Um, I can tell you that at the moment, the um, state smart solar siting system requires that any any land that's in Chapter sixty one or sixty one A, I'm sorry, in sixty one A, do dual use solar. So all of those, which are the basically all of the farmland in Whateley currently would do, if they wanted to do solar, would be required to do dual use. 
-hmm. and thus exempt from the fee. The intent here is mm -hmm. to, if, if this was part of a redo of the solar bylaws and the planning board had the problem of trying to balance the need for more solar energy against the property rights of the owners and the desire for abutters not to, not to have so many solar systems they were looking at. We implemented some, some screening requirements, some setback requirements, and we felt it appropriate that solar, solar facilities, um, if you are doing one, then you could invest in saving other, by, other land for the town. And, and that's the intent. So, so this goes to the open space fund, CPA open space fund, um, it's, which is charged with preserving land for the town, for preserving open space. No, that, that sounds great. I'm, I'm just trying to get some, even a rough idea of how much mm -hmm. money this would generate. Oh. I think I, I think under the current under the current uh, stipulations for requiring dual dual use solar, I wouldn't expect any. Yeah, okay. I'd be surprised. You might get it some years. You might not get it others. It will depend completely on if chapter land is being taken. You know, land is being taken out of chapter for solar facility. I That's, thought I thought when we started this, you might be looking at something like. I don't know, um, 20 acres a year or something. But um, mm -hmm. with the requirement for dual use and the exemption for dual use, that's the main, that's been the historic use in Waitley. I would be very surprised if there were, was anybody trying to site land up in the hills where the timberland is in Waitley. So, um, I, I don't think the finance committee or the CPA should be looking for a lot of money coming out of this right now. Okay. But these these state laws change and we don't review the bylaws all that often. So it's good to it's good to have it there. No, that's fine. I appreciate the committee's work. I just want to get no, on record question. what kind of impact, fair question. impact I, there might be. When we started, we thought there might be some revenue. I'm not sure now. Okay. All right. Well, I would entertain a motion then. I move we accept the report, the recommendations of the resource replacement committee. I'll second that. Um, all those in favor? Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Okay, great. Okay, well, now that that schedule, I, I was a little surprised to see Joe here early. So uh, I guess that must have been a little bit of a scheduling mix up. Let's go back to um, where we left off, which I think was, uh, we finished COVID-19 on number five, number six, old business. And the first piece of old business is to discuss the disposition process, lease or sale of the Waitley Center School. And I have to say, I I, I, it was nice to have a little review in our packet. Um, and maybe I would like to hand this over to Hannah or Brian to remind us kind of where we are on these steps. Sure. Um, so we're at the, so the board issued the, the request for information and received a couple, you know, a couple responses that the board had had talked about at a, at a previous meeting. And I, I think the board had left it. This was, I think, before the holidays that we're going to start moving towards the drafting of an RFP. Um, so I just wanted to lay out um, the process that the disposition process and have, 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 a, have a conversation as, as to where the board wants to go with this. Um, so this is the process on the screen. Um, declare the property available for disposition and identify use restrictions, determine the value, and then develop the solicitation. 
Um, so declaring the property available for disposition is, is quite simple. It's the, the select board would take a take a vote to say the property surplus and um, that goes in the on record as as the property being available. And then determine the value of the property. It's either through an appraisal or an assess or the town's assessment. I have a concern that I need to discuss with the board of assessors. I don't think that they pay much attention to the assessment on town properties because there's no tax basis. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's it doesn't it doesn't quite matter um, whether it's up to date or not. Um, there's not a tax bill that's generated from it. So um, it, it may very well be that we may need to have an appraisal done. Um, and why that might be important uh, for a sale is um, there's requirements if the town disposes of the property for less than its fair market value, it needs to be for a public purpose because there's a, a benefit to the purchaser of the property, um, a, a discount, so to speak. So um, we may need to do that. But but before we get to that, um, in terms of in terms of developing the solicitation, so it could be a request for proposals, but the the request for proposals needs to be pretty specific about about what the town is looking for. Um, and it needs to be it needs to be specific as to whether the town is thinking about an outright sale or or a lease of some a lease of some sort. Um, or maybe that's not the road that the board wants to go down and wants to look at um, some type of continued ownership and rehabilitation. Um, the center school report, uh, the center school visioning committee report, um, you know, laid out a couple recommendations in terms of, of what they thought about those 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 various scenarios. Um, I started trying to pull together a couple RFPs and I and I was looking through them. So the drafting of the RFP is not going to be the hard part. It's going to be um, really figuring out what path we want to go down. Um, you know, the school's in the shape it's currently in. Um, I don't know that uh, anybody who's interested in a, a short-term lease would want to pay for renovations or upgrade, especially to, to uh, central mechanical things like the heating and the roof and... Uh, you know, if there's septic work needed, it's that's not attractive to somebody who's looking for a short-term lease. Um, it may be for somebody who has a long-term lease who can, who can, who can get back those costs over the, over the period of a, of a period of years. But so I guess I'm I, I'm at a point where I don't really know how to move forward without without guidance, uh, and I don't know if that's a decision that's made tonight or there's another meeting where. We spend more time talking about it, um, mm -hmm. but I just want to sort of tell you where I feel we're at um, in the process. I yeah, I would several, go ahead, Fred. No, I you know looking back at the report from the from the committee from a couple of years ago, I would very much want to follow the advice of that committee and they're you know not look at a sale at this point the sale is really a last resort that we want to try to control keep as much control over the property as possible so you know in that respect i would have no problem in putting out an rfp that dealt with a lease and see if there were any suggestion any proposals that came out of that uh, mm -hmm. And as far as the Board of Assessment goes, can we not just request that they do an up-to-date assessment on this, and then we can work from that? I think that's the first approach, yeah. That's and I think we can see where that lands us. Yeah, I, did, I felt like half a million dollars was kind of a high number. Is that also what your sense is no that that was my sense too that it seemed high for a building that was not right by zoning requirements suitable for anything yeah and you know with the with you know with all the various problems it has that i couldn't understand the building being worth three hundred seventy three thousand dollars 
Um, so that um, that that I was very surprised at. So I'm glad that that's not sort of a, a firm number necessarily. Uh, that that's something that can be looked at in more detail and to see if that's if that's really what it's worth. Um, um, but an assessment and appraisal are different things. So uh, it may be worth pursuing an appraisal um, as well. I don't know when you've got two different numbers, do you take their average <laughs> or, or you may you may have um, yeah. Uh, and Brian, if we're looking to lease the property, how does the that assessment slash appraisal come into play? I, I understand certainly if we're looking to sell, mm -hmm. but does it really matter what that number comes to if we're soliciting a lease? I, I think it's less important. Yeah, I, yeah. I would think so. Yeah. Uh, so and, I, I would say rather than go through the expense of commissioning an appraisal, let's get a current assessment from the Board of Assessment. Uh, and then I would, I, I would reiterate, I, I would be looking at a lease rather than a sale. Yeah. Um, now, can you remind me, what were the, we had gotten some, um, we had put out an RFI earlier, right? And we had gotten some responses. Can you remind me what the responses were suggesting to do with the building? Yeah, uh, generally I can, and I can, I can resend those out to the board. Um, one was for um, one was for sort of an alternative school um, oh, for okay. I think for self directed learning. Yeah, and then okay. the other now one was. Um, but this proposal for, I think, affordable daycare in the, the lower level um, with some offices in the main level and I think maybe a, a dwelling unit above. If I recall, I'm trying to come from memory. Uh, I don't mm. have them in front of me. Yeah. But I think those okay. were the. Yeah. Now, now that's that my, I, a couple of brain cells just fired here. And now, now I think I remember. Um, I remember those. Okay. And both of those, they don't sound like, either one of them would be ones that would necessarily want to buy the building, right? But if we're leasing a building, then, <clears throat> I mean, we've got to do upkeep and we've got to be able to maybe charge enough so that we cover some, in, in an ideal world, all of the costs associated with, um, with upkeep. So, yeah, I, I think it will depend, yeah. depend on on the on the type of the lease. If we're just gonna if we're gonna lease the entire building out for let's say fifty years, um, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much how we're gonna deal with it, and the, the tenant can have you know full control over it. Well, to an extent, full control over it. There, there wouldn't be a lot for us to do. But if if we we're thinking about a multi tenant situation with common space and that type of thing, it will probably require some type of building management. Um, that would need to take place. Yeah. I, I think if we put out an RFP, see what we get back in terms of mm. uh, yeah. proposals for how people, you know, what terms people would want to lease that on. Yeah. Does that give you enough to, because I, I, what I heard from Brian earlier was you're not really sure how to proceed on that RFP we you needed more guidance does the yeah. idea of go for a lease rather than a sale does that give you enough to move forward a little bit on an rfp uh, i i think so and we're thinking more of, are we thinking more of the well i mean we can make it general but are we thinking more of the the sort of long-term lease here's the building mm -hmm. um Hmm. tenant is responsible for upgrades or are we thinking more maybe shorter term multi-tenant the town's going to have some probably cost related to building management types hmm. of things well the cost i'm the most worried about is the time that people who are on this meeting will have to spend sorting out problems when they occur because it's not an if really they'll be there i mean there will be problems 
So it might be the first one you described actually is a bit more appealing to me because I think you have your hands full. I think Hannah has her hands full. Um, Amy, I don't see her twiddling her thumbs ever, really. Um, I, I don't think we have a lot of bandwidth to be managing buildings for tenants. Um, yeah, I think, I, I think reason, our preference would be to try to have a long-term lease where the tenant is responsible for the upkeep and repairs. Brian? And it may, may mean a, a, a lower rent, right? right. Um, but I think one of the reasons the, the rental of that space that for Sandy Lane works as well as it does is because it it does not take a lot of time. They're good tenants. They The space fits what they need. They do their work. They pay their, <laughs> pay their lease. And we're not always in there having to fix things for them, right? Right. And, and right now, our uh, income from either leasehold or taxes is zero. Right. So even a small rent is better than what right. we're doing now. Yeah. Could I make a comment, please? Sure, Judy. I was on the committee. Our thought was that it would be a long-term rental and the the renter would be responsible for the for the for the capital expenditures of improving the building in return for a very low rent. And one thought was that they would perhaps be able to do this at a lower cost than the, the town because of prevailing the prevailing. Yeah. wage rate requirement that the town has to pay. And I gather that's a function of how much of the renovation and the rehabilitation is for the use, for the requirements of the, the tenant, the person who's paying it as opposed to benefit the town. So that, that was the thought process that the committee had when they recommended the, the yeah. lease option. Yeah. We, we may also have to look at a lease that has a variable provision based on how much money in grants comes in to go to the repair. That if we anticipate that the tenant will pay for upgrade uh, for the repairs on the building, which will be necessary, and the rehabilitation of it, but if a lot of that ends up coming out of grants and not out of the pocket of the tenant, then the lease, then the rent might have to go up. Hmm. You're ahead of I, us, but fine. Right. No, yeah, no, true. And I, but I guess the, the other thing he says is there any? Do we want any use restrictions? And to me, that's a that's kind of a harder question. Um, I think if you look at the zoning and what can be done under the zoning, it, it's, it's pretty restrictive. It re, mm -hmm. It's limited to retail stores, no greater than 2,000 square feet. Um, yeah. Oh, no, I, I wasn't thinking about um, zoning restrictions. Well, um, they, they, they I, actually... I, I wasn't thinking about zoning okay, restrictions. Sorry, I wasn't thinking of breaking them either, but I was thinking if this is a long-term lease and one of the scenarios was that um, it's kind of broken up into three parts, the, you know, uh, a housing unit, an office and a, and a daycare are those three, like whoever is doing this is subletting it out and by signing a long-term lease, what kind of restrictions do we want to okay. put on just kind of subletting this out ad infinitum? It, it, or is that is that the wrong approach? Is that the wrong kind of thing to try and retain any control over? I mean, I think they have to obey the zoning laws. There's, so there's no, I, I don't think that's a, a an issue, but... Um, 
But my point was that they, they constrained things pretty well to be, make it sensible for the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think what we would do here is we would have a, we would have a draft lease or a sample lease that we would that we would mm -hmm. you know have has an have as an attachment to the RFP that may lay out those certain you know certain things about mm -hmm. subletting you know certain things that you'll typically see in a lease um okay so i think that might be one of the ones that we would we would talk about and i, I think you know once we get the RFP together then we'll have the 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 sample lease and we can obviously we'll come back and and, and the board can discuss the the RFP specifics of the RFP, um, but yes, okay. things things in the lease like that, and you know things about you know what what modifications are acceptable to the building or not, right? I know we're talking about use restrictions, so I'm kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but you know what they can and can't do with the facade, maybe, and things like that um, are, are things that the town may want to, the board may want to have some say in. Mm -hmm. Well, if the discussion so far, do you need us to vote on anything to be able to take your next steps? I don't think I need to vote. I, I think I, I think I have the feedback that I need to to move this okay. forward. Um, yeah, that's definitely really helpful because now now we can tailor the RFP to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a longer term lease. And... Okay. All right. Great. All right, we're uh, we're cruising through this uh, through this agenda, aren't we? Um, the, oh, the next one uh, under old business, we need to prioritize the DLTA, the District Local Technical Assistance Project requests, and submit them to FERCOG. And that has to prioritization has to happen tonight because that's coming up due, right? Yeah, so actually it was um, technically due at the end of January, but we got an extension. Um, mm. I said we would turn it in as soon as we possibly could. Okay, um, so we better do it tonight. <laughs> if possible, that would be great. Yep. Yeah. Um, so this is a matrix of all of the suggestions that we received from different mm -hmm. um, boards and committees that responded to the request for ideas. Um, you can't really see the contrast very well, but I tried to color code it to the best of my ability based on um, similar topics. Mm -hmm. So the orange yep. has to do with renewable energy projects. Um, and then the there are a couple electric vehicle charging station suggestions from the Board of Health and the Conservation mm -hmm. Commission. Sure. Um, those are colored in blue. And then uh, in green are the projects we're already working on. So that includes a lot of these affordable housing projects. Um, I created a draft version of the prioritized list um, and sent it to FERCOG with the understanding that it could easily be entirely different from what we actually end up submitting to them. <laughs> um, and that list was based more on, um, I thought it was kind of hard to determine the urgency of any of these projects. So it was based more on representation from all of the boards to the best of my ability. Um, so I will share my screen and I can show you um, the prioritized list, but I think in order to do that, perfect. Okay. Share. Um, so here's the prioritized list at the bottom. This was all of the potential projects that uh, different boards and committees could have said they were interested in. I suggested that for our top three choices, um, the planning board only submitted one suggestion, which was this energy resilience planning and zoning. Um, and it was related to other energy projects that people suggested. So I put that as the first choice. Um, the second choice, it was hard to determine which was higher priority. So um, I put these here with, of course, again, the understanding that it could be entirely wrong, but um, the suggestion that we engage in a municipal service sharing feasibility study for a conservation commission agent. Um, and then the third representation was from the Board of Health for the expansion and connection of regional public transit. Um, so here's the matrix again. I tried to color it a little bit better so that you can mm. see, but these are the top three choices from the Board of Health, Conservation Commission and Planning Board.
Well, when I looked at your summary, I came to almost the same conclusion as you did, or maybe the exact same one. I really thought um, there's a need <clears throat> on the planning board for more like information regarding the renewable energy, especially battery storage projects. Because the meeting I went to, it was just people screaming nonsense. Um, and and we we need to make decisions based on um, good information and not just um, somebody's worst nightmare fears or somebody's you know just over um, um, over optimistic um, ideas. So I to me that one stuck out as one that I I know we would really benefit from um, and. The, uh, I had not thought about a conservation agent, presuming that's sh like sharing with, with other towns who have similar conservation issues. Exactly. Um, and I think that that sort of also falls under the category of getting more uh, like people who know their stuff to help us make our decisions. Exactly. Which is, I think, a, a really good one. And what did you end up putting for your third? The third um, the was the regional transit. public transit. Um, that one, I sort of felt like, what can we do about that? I mean, it's it's really, is the state going to fund it or not? And I'm not sure that, like, like what, what would a technical assistant grant help us do regarding expansion and connection there? I just, I guess I don't understand where technical assistance would help on that one. Whereas I do sort of feel like some technical assistance might help on those others. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. You can school me here and tell me how it would be. So that's, I'm, I'm perfectly open to hearing all that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's really important to expand public transportation just in general. Um, mm -hmm. In this specific instance, I was trying to work more just from top priorities submitted by other boards rather than how mm. feasible the projects actually would be. Um, and then was hoping that we could kind of work together. So I think that that is something that um, while it would be valuable to learn more about that, maybe could be a project for other grants or for future research. Um, yeah, I, I, I looked at the lists and the, the recommendations. I would think that assist that for this particular uh, type of assistance, that it's help with the housing, the, the senior housing or the housing production plan would be a more practical suggestion than the transit as, as the third option. Yeah, so we're already working with FERCOG on the housing production plan. Um, we could ask for more technical assistance. Um, it just depends on how much I think you want to uh, mm. diversify the work that we're doing. Yeah, no, I, I still think that the other two are the first two choices that we're talking about. Yeah. I would yeah. talk about swapping that in for a third choice. Um, so I, I agree I with Joyce that I, I just don't yeah. think, see the utility of a transit advisor. Thing. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm also trying to think of like what, what is like for cog technical assistance good for and it might be that you know it, it's sort of you know helping gather information and helping you making arguments so that you can get maybe leverage that for other um other resources sometimes that's what the technical assistance comes down to right um so the um renewable energy planning and implementation including municipal charging stations I think is going to be becoming an issue for us because I understand down the road the next um, highway department vehicle that needs to be replaced is a truck that could be replaced with an electric truck. Um, yep. The police they're on I don't know where we are in the cycle, but it could well be that our next police vehicle is an electric vehicle. Um, and if, if I have anything to say about it, it, it would be so. Um, I wonder then about the renewable energy planning and implementation, including municipal charging stations might be, um, I know it was third choice under Board of Health, 
but it might be something that we would benefit from given that we may be purchasing those kind of vehicles soon soon yeah. meaning the next you know two years three years yeah definitely so then you're hoping to put um electric vehicle charging station uh assistance for the third choice yeah that, that's fine with me too yeah. okay sounds good okay does that need to does that require a vote yes okay um then i fred give me a motion i move the uh i don't know what the term is the <laughs> district local priority, technical assistance request. For the, um, like local technical assistance right uh as amended to replace the trans the third choice uh to make the third choice the charging station assistance rather than the transit assistance okay Oh, uh, all righty. Um, I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay. That item is taken care of. And I see we have some guests. Our guests are back. Mm -hmm. So um, we just finished our old business. Let's go back to scheduled appointments. And we've got um, Senator Joe Comerford and Representative Natalie Blay. Welcome, both of you. And I see your assistants, Elena and Corinne, are here. Uh, welcome to you all. Um, and the, I guess this is a little bit of you're going to give us some update and you're going to let us whine for a little while, right? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> uh, we'll try. We'll try not to whine in, a, in an annoying way, um, and just kind of talk about issues and ideas for for some time. Okay. And I don't know who, if you guys have planned, who's going to chat first. Senator Comerford, please. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> I'll kick off. I was the problem earlier. Let us just get that very clear. Um, we got, we got so, side. We got try. We there was some some yeah. stuff happening in the universe with the interweb, and uh, we got some traffic. It was fine. Yeah. She's being very nice, and that is completely false. Um, I clicked the wrong link. Um, so, um, but I love Natalie Blay for this reason, and so 150,000 others. Um, but first, let me. Just, I just want to start by saying what's true for me, which is that I love Waitley and have loved working with Natalie in Waitley, and I'm very sad that I'm losing Waitley in the redistricting. Um, I just want to say that up front. Um, it has been an honor to serve you, Elena, and I love the community, um, love the stellar work you do, um, and have loved the partnership with Natalie. In the Senate, we had a choice to make, and I do think we made the right choice, but it's not without its, its, its fallout. We had to choose whether or not, it, you know, since Adam Hines was running for lieutenant governor while redistricting was happening, whether or not to allow the, that Berkshire Senate seat to be basically sucked in um, and used, basically carved up and used to help make up the population loss. The Senate didn't want that to happen because we would have lost a seat out here and there's only five of us to begin with. And um, we thought that was the wrong choice for Western Massachusetts. But it did mean that the Berkshire, the Ber Berkshire district, which lost considerable population, had to collide into all of the other districts. Our district, the Hampshire Franklin Worcester district also lost population, although not as significant. Um, but we had to help the Berkshire district gain people um, and they gained, it gained Waitley. Um, and it was, you know, it was partly a numbers game as we were looking at, uh, and again, I didn't draw the maps, but as the conversations were happening. Um, and the, you know, it has been the Hampshire Berkshire, Hampshire Franklin Berkshire district. Um, there are many beautiful communities in that district. Um, and I hate that it has you guys and I don't have you guys. I am going up over the Quabbin. Um, and so I'm gaining four communities in Worcester. And, and truthfully, I don't think they're so happy to have me, but um, because we, <laughs> they're just, I think they're, they're mourning the loss of Angobi. Um, so there's just a lot of change to be had. Um, in the region, um, but uh, you know, between now and um, you know, when I 
I'm running again and I'll have to run to earn the votes of the new district. And when I begin that work, um, you know, I hope to have left uh, the work in partnership with Natalie on your behalf solidly. And I am still your state senator. Um, people have, you'll have different opinions about how this works. Some folks stop working in communities after redistricting. That is not what Natalie and I are doing. And, um, and so I'm going to stay with you all the way through the year um, and, you know, and then serve another, serve another 25 communities in the coming session. So that's not an issue substance, but I did want to say it because for me, it was the sort of tug at my heart as I was coming to talk with you this evening. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Natalie, do you want to go next? I just, I just want to say how um, sad I am <laughs> that, that this district change is happening. And it's, it's been such a joy to, to represent Waitley with Senator Comerford. Uh, Waitley will remain in the first Franklin district along with um, a lot of Franklin County towns will be added in the Northwestern uh, side of, of Franklin County. Um, and I think, you know, this is both of our first times with redistricting. And I have to say that after building such strong relationships with communities uh, since we were first elected, I feel Joe's pain. And I just want to recognize that uh, because it's, it's a real honor to work alongside you and get to know you and partner with you on so many important issues. And uh, I don't know about you, Joe, but, uh, you know, I'm losing a lot of communities and gaining several new communities. And um, I don't, I don't think anything could have prepared me for the loss that I felt and, and also the opportunity to, to represent these new communities. So it, it is a, um, it's a, it's a very conflicting feeling. And, and uh, I just want to, to recognize that Joe and just let you know how incredible it's been to work with you, uh, in support of Waitley. Thank you. It's, it's mutually felt, um, we love Waitley equally. Um, and you're right, you know, the, the opportunity is for all of us in the region, you know, with new colleagues coming in, there's a real sea change happening in the region. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity there, um, you know, for reconfigurations and new blood and new energy. Uh, so I think you should expect that the region will remain strong um, as we have been over these last two sessions and before that, of course. Um, and it's just going to, you know, change is sometimes hard. But we're here tonight to, to hear from you. This is something that we try to do annually. Well, we have done annually uh, to, to make sure that we're touching base with you so that we understand what your priorities are as we head into the budget season uh, and the second year of this legislative session. Uh, just to make sure that that we're all on the same page and that we're identifying opportunities to partner with one another. I do want to thank you for submitting testimony in support of the legislation that Senator Comerford and I have offered around municipal buildings and public safety complexes. Uh, the outpouring of support there was incredibly powerful. Uh, the number of Western Mass residents who submitted testimony or appeared in person virtually one of the benefits of COVID that our voices are being heard in the state house through this format is really, really powerful. So I wanna thank you for, for sending that testimony in. Keith, you know, we've been working on unpaved roads and, and road maintenance and increasing chapter 90. We're gonna to continue to, to do that, uh, but we can only do that and we can only have wins with partnerships like, like the one that we have with Waitley. And so, uh, I just, we're here to listen to you and to make sure that we understand what your priorities are going forward. Let's see. Um, do you have anything you want to bring up first, Fred? No, I, oh. nothing I, needy except to thank Joe for her <clears throat> representation over the last couple of years, and we will miss you. And Hope, we hope we can have as good a relationship with Adam as we've had with you. Well, Adam, Adam's off to the lieutenant governor race, so it'll be it'll be the person who's running for that seat. Oh, well, um, okay. Um, so isn't but, that Paul Marks is running for it, I think? Paul Mark is running currently. I, I don't know if there's anybody else yet in the race. I, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, but Adam is, you know, Adam is a good human. 
um, and he's on to a, you know, a big adventure for sure. Yeah. Um, well, I've been, you know, it's been thinking about it in the back of my head since I first learned you were going to be at our select board meeting. And um, uh, this is like, you know, this is in between, um, you know, the electronics lab and the intro physics classroom. And the, the, so, so um, uh, it's, it's, it might seem like this is kind of scattered, uh, but um, one of the things that um, has been on my mind is, and you might, you might know where the wind is blowing on this one. And that is, you know, having our public meetings um, able to be done in a forum like this with Zoom, I think has actually brought a lot of benefits. And uh, my understanding of the current law, which I believe Waitley has adopted and our select board has adopted, um, the, the, is it would require that um, um, pretty much a majority, including the chair has to be in the room. Um, and it is, so it's a little bit restrictive for allowing people who are serving on boards to participate remotely. And I'm wondering if there is um, anything in the works to loosen that up to allow um, more flexible remote participation by members of boards. And I say this sort of in the context of just how busy everyone is. It's hard to get volunteers to do things. And sometimes the like there, there are meetings where I am sure I would not have made that meeting because of if I actually had to travel and be there in person. Uh, and there are some meetings now, there's a committee that I'm on that they don't, just don't like meeting with anybody on there virtually. And I've missed, you know, I've missed two meetings already. And maybe maybe they don't mind not having my input, but um, I, I would like to be there to to um, have my input. I think it's been, and, and so I, I understand that remote participation will be like allowed, especially for the public. And we've now got equipment that'll help us do that. Um, but I was trying to think of ways to make it easier for people who are volunteering essentially for for local boards to be able to continue remote participation in a more flexible way like maybe the chair doesn't always have to be there maybe it can be you know maybe, you know maybe it's just some kind of loosening up of those restrictions which are going to come back at some point and I don't remember the date on the horizon for the um for this kind of emergency override of the open meeting law but maybe you have some information Thank you so much um, uh, for this. And, you know, your story and the way you characterized it is just emblematic of why this, why we have to continue to enshrine remote participation. Um, I do think, I'll just speak only for the Senate now, I do think that the Senate is also taking stock, of, it's just as Natalie said, about the much greater diversity of voices that we've heard and what we're hearing from our constituents, hello, um, what we're hearing from our constituents um, in terms of uh, their participation in the process at the state house. Um, so in the COVID supplemental bill that is on the governor's desk, um, some of the remote provisions you're talking about are extended <clears throat> in the bill. Um, mm -hmm. The house and the Senate work, Natalie worked on the house side, I worked on the Senate side, they're, they're there. Um, and, you know, uh, I think there's, a, and I, I do believe what you're calling us to in terms of volunteers being able to do it and um, like sort of a, a transformation of the structures has to be a piece of work that we take on rather than just extending um, these remote meeting provisions. And so um, I love that you've called us to that. I think that's real. That plus what Natalie talked about in terms of the state house going virtual. Um, you know, or allowing some participation in the process virtually um, have to be part of, you know, if there are any silver linings of this terrible pandemic, it has to be that we recognize mm -hmm. the power of technology and we should harness it where we can. Um, so you'll see that you'll see some of the, you know, the extensions that you need and deserve, but you're talking about something much bigger that, that I do believe there's a conversation happening about and we have to continue that. 100% agree, it, it, absolutely. 
Go if ahead, I can just follow up on that, it gets very difficult out here, especially in the western part of the state, where we have three person select boards dealing with, you know, open meeting log and three people is very difficult. And the same thing with the uh, with the remote meetings that, that, for instance, Jonathan's not here today. Based on these rules, Joyce and I would both have to go in because to get a majority. Yeah. And it's, it's just very difficult to sometimes to work around the rules that were designed for bigger mm. bodies with a three person body. Just to highlight the importance of what you're saying here tonight, uh, this is the second time today, <laughs> so within a 12 hour period that this has been brought up by communities. Uh, the other the other meeting was at nine o'clock this morning and we talked about exactly the same thing. So this is certainly something that uh, is, as Senator Comerford indicated, is something that I think we were called to action on. And, you know, COVID has left us with the silver linings uh, and I'm serving on the reopening working group and, you know, we're trying to better understand how we can increase access to the state house post pandemic. How can we you know, look at hybrid hearings to continue to allow people who can make it to the state house to participate in person and, and how we might be able to continue to allow you know, folks who cannot make it into the state house to participate virtually and, and really providing for that accessibility uh, for all residents of the Commonwealth. And, and so that's something that, that we're really trying to, to explore and, and, and is truly important work. So th thank you for lifting that up, both Joyce and Fred. Okay. Um, I guess uh, one other thing that's um, come up and I, you won't be too surprised, you know, I'm an uh, electrical engineer. So whenever electric things come up, I'm always excited about those, but um, a couple of things kind of under the electric umbrella, the electric umbrella, hmm, I don't have one of those, um, is, uh, you know, we're hearing, I guess one is sort of on electricity supply and the other is on renewable electric energy infrastructure. And I feel like the, one of the things I guess I would have to say as a, as a positive and keep going and keep doing more of is helping us get better uh, like electric charging station infrastructure established, getting um, uh, support for re renewable um, energy and uh, and I think keep keep up the good work and it's probably never going to be quite enough, but um, uh, especially on the storage, it seems like that's something that's really important to be supporting and which uh, relates to the other thing that, you know, we're hearing from you know, ISO about their ability to provide power. They they don't they they've always been resistant to using renewables, which maybe this will help them change. But they're you know they're right now um, sort of um, maybe threatening is too strong a word, but they did send out a notice saying, hey, you could have random rolling blackouts. We don't care about your public safety infrastructure. Well, they didn't use those words. They use different words. So the folks who are listening from newspapers should get the actual text from our town administrator. Um, but, but, but basically threatening, hey, you guys, we could, we could black you out and we're not going to pay any attention to whether we black out. We can't, we can't preserve your public safety complexes or, you know, um, they, they, so for us, that would mean like South County EMS, it wouldn't be prioritized. Um, uh, and, and you probably are hearing this from a lot of other people. Um, and I don't know how much control the state has over that, but that is something that's been on my mind, both the let's keep going with the renewables and the can't we get them going faster so that we don't have to have... Um, I mean, they, they're blaming the problem on not being able to store enough natural gas um, and having lost coal and having lost nuclear sources that haven't been replaced yet. But I would really like to see that replacement be with renewables. And 
um, as much as we can can speed up that and not spend, you know, waste more money on more carbon infrastructure. That would be that, you know, that would be ideal. And I think you probably agree with me on a lot of those things, but those are the things that have been on my mind and that's what you wanted to know. <clears throat> yeah, I wanna, well, Brian, I wanna thank you and, and the select board for, for sending the notifications that you had received to us, you know, as, as a result of your communication to us. And, you know, as I, I think I said at the beginning, you know, we view this as a partnership. And you know, as a result of you sending that our way, we were then able to, to do some digging and find out exactly what was going on there. So I, I wanna thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, I think it was, it was very important. Um, I wanna just, the one other piece I wanted to address here as we're talking about the grid is uh, the house recently introduced a wind bill. Uh, and as a result of, advocacy from people across the Commonwealth and, and Senator Comerford as, as the co-sponsor on the Senate side, um, there's a really significant uh, piece of that legislation as proposed that, that would create a grid modernization consumer board. And this is a bill that Senator Comerford and I have offered and is worked into this wind bill um, in recognition of the fact that Massachusetts has an antiquated electrical grid that presents challenges for distributed generation. And you know, as we're looking at, at renewable energy like solar and wind and, and other modern green technologies. And the fact of the matter is that ISO New England, DPU uh, just aren't moving fast enough, particularly as we are trying to meet our climate change goals. So this legislation, um, it really is important to begin to address the future of, of our, our green economy and making sure that our grid is equipped to handle the influx of this renewable energy technology. And, and this is one of the many things that I, I've worked with Senator Comerford on. And it is really incredible that you know, this is that we were able to get this into the House version of this wind bill. I loved what Natalie just said. I, I couldn't say it better, except to say that the Senate, um, my understanding is that the Senate will meet the House's good work. And so um, what's exciting about that is that, you know, we'll be able to join the House. So the House is going to lead on climate and, and the work that Natalie was just talking about, Repla was just talking about is so critical and the leadership that she brought to it to get grid modernization inside this wind bill. And I will say just this is an aside, but it's really the it's the, the power of people. That grid modernization bill, when it was first filed, was like a head scratcher for so many people, but it was public testimony um, that helped, helped the legislature understand the imperative of grid modernization. Um, so Natalie getting it into the House bill is like an unbelievable win. Um, so the Senate will match it. I think the Senate's going to do um, its piece of work more on the solar side uh, and focus on a bill that Natalie and I also care about it and, and work on a, like solar siting and how best to equitably site solar, especially with uh, this thing called a single tax parcel, um, which is would allow um, more units within a single tax parcel to get the benefits of net metering. Um, it's an equity bill and it's a solar flourishing bill. Um, and we're making some good gains on that. That was that got a favorable report. So I'm hoping mm -hmm. that that's going to be in the Senate's proposal. And so the House will do win, the Senate will maybe lay down more on solar and we'll be able to see um, more of the gains. You know, the last climate bill we passed was important. It was an important bill, but it was pretty mm -hmm. high up, you know, in the structural change, right? Um, you know, the Board of Building Standards, you know, the BBRS, they got some more people, the DPU got a little bit more regulation, but it was, these were high up tweaks. And I'm, I think both bodies are coming down now to implementation, um, as Ripley was saying, and it's just where we need to be, including um, EV charging, um, and really making real, like, how are we going to get to 2050 and a net zero Commonwealth? We have to really accelerate the kind of progress that you're calling us to accelerate on. Um, you know, so thank you. 
I, I've got, with regard to the uh, EV charging, is there some way that we can get more information at the town level of what vehicles are available for different purposes? Like what tractors or fire trucks or police cars or whatever have, because they're coming onto the market all the time. You know, new, you know, bigger vehicles that can be, can handle electric. Can we get more information about what might be available so that we know, you know, what is out there? You know, say we have to buy a new tractor. Is there an electric vehicle that's available that might meet that need or is it not yet, does it not yet exist? We don't, we don't know that. I think it's, so I don't know that that resource exists right now from the Commonwealth, but I think it's an important resource that the Commonwealth could provide in terms of vehicles that are currently out there um, that would help us to meet our climate goals and, and have that wide range. You know, to, to understand tractors, uh, I think that's gonna have to be a real ask from, from us here in Western Massachusetts to make sure that, mm. that those sorts of vehicles are on that list. Right, because we, yeah. we, we have to make decisions, you know, do we buy a diesel vehicle or do we buy an electric vehicle? Does the electric vehicle exist? Does it fit the need? It's a great question. I mean, it's a great point, Fred. Yeah, I think it's great. And I agree with Natalie. I don't know offhand if, uh, I don't think there is such a resource, um, but I can't say for 100% sure. But if you, if the town has specific needs or interests, um, as Natalie was talking about, you know, and you were talking about Fred Tractor's um, we could go to MDAR, you know, the Mass Department of Agricultural Resource, yeah. and we could say, you know, look, our town wants to buy a, you know, a, an electric tractor. Do you know of any sources? You know, so we could go to the specific agencies that may be um, plugged in here. <laughs> Sorry the, for the pun. But, uh, <laughs> no, no, but, uh, no. uh, but, you know, police cars, you know, we could go to, um, uh, mm. you know, MPTC or, um, EOPS and see if there's you know, if if they would have an understanding or resources that we could give you. So if you had specific interests, we could chase down those. Yeah, but sometimes at the the rate this is moving, if we if you go this week and they say it doesn't exist, next week it might. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 If I could, I'd like to interject also, we've been discussing electric vehicles, so I feel this is a good time to talk about gas tax. As we all know, gas tax, it's antiquated. It's headed for failure and the importance of replacing it um, ASAP to get some type of money to, you know, we all complain about how our roads have potholes. Chapter 90 has been pretty much more or less level funded for many years while construction costs continue to escalate. And so, it, you know, and I realize it's something that's got to be also done at the federal level too, because you can't have one state eliminate gas tax while other states still have it. And, and when you drive from one state to another. So I feel it's got to have to be something done all at the same time nationwide, but um, so it's a bigger picture than just Massachusetts, but it's certainly the importance around here. We're all complaining like about potholes right now, and you drive your electric car through a pothole and you make it just as much bigger as the gas powered one does, and they're not paying anything for it. So. Thank you, Rosal. It's important that they have electricity. Okay. Um, I see there's some other people here, um, Hannah and Amy and Brian. I'm wondering if you all have things you'd like to uh, jump in with. Oh, I do. Oh, all right, Brian. I got a whole list here. Just kidding. Okay, now I'm, I'm going to start. I'm going to dig into my dinner here, but I'm listening, all right. okay? All right, so first, um, thank you both for your help with the Haydenville Road Project. Um, as most people know, MassDOT is, is, is paying for 100% of the design of that project, and we're able to get that 100%, well, 100% plus some right-of-way costs that we need to pay for, for the construction of that project that will probably land somewhere in the ballpark of $10 million once it's done. Obviously, the, the town of Whitley's 
not able to even come close to paying that for itself. So uh, thank you for, for the work on that. Uh, it's been a long time coming, um, but we're getting closer. We just had the 25% design hearing. So it's scheduled for construction, uh, construction year, uh, fiscal year 2025 in the Franklin tip. So um, we're, we're very optimistic about that. Um, so thank you. Um, I just want to touch on the, the ISO New England um, Eversource notice that, that we received. Um, there was a webinar that uh, happened today. I thought it was very informative. I think, I, don't, I think it was mostly Eversource that put it on. Um, it was great to learn that, um, well, it wasn't great to learn that, you know, the, the, the reasons behind the problem are essentially that, that we're very dependent on natural gas. Um, as a as a single fuel source, it was I think it was about fifty percent of our generation capacity is natural gas. So, if that supply chain becomes bottlenecked or somehow cut off, it, it it's extremely problematic for for the region, um, with cold weather or not. Um, if it, it's it's we're not really in a great situation. Part of that is 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 due to the loss of I think they said around seven thousand megawatts of generation since twenty thirteen have come off the grid. Now, some of those are probably, um, I think some of those are coal and oil and um, and nuclear and in and, and fuels that we wanna get away from, but I think that we also need to get away from them at, at a responsible, in, in a responsible fashion. Um, so it, it still left me with the question sort of, sort of how, how do we get into this position and, and sort of not necessarily blame, but who's keeping an eye on what's happening here so that it, it doesn't happen um, and it doesn't happen again. Um, it, it sounded from what it sounded from the webinar that that there's there's not going to be a fix for for a while. Um, you know, they were talking about offshore wind coming on, you know, coming online, but that's not for a couple of years. So they never really talked about, you know, how it gets fixed um, and how it gets fixed over the next couple of years. So it's it, it left me with the you know, the, the feeling that this is something that we're going to have to deal with for next winter and maybe the following winter and the winter after that. And, you know, the response, I think the message was, well, make sure you have generators at your critical facilities, because if this does happen, well, you know, you need to have electricity for these. And it was sort of, it was eye opening to me. And I, I just, I didn't see a solution proposed, I guess is what I'm getting at. And I don't know, I don't know the, 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 the path to, um, to pursue that, but um, that's what sort of what I came away with was that there's a problem. Um, municipalities can take steps to, um, you know, protect ourselves and, and, and power our critical facilities, but I'm not sure what the solution is. And I think that's something that needs to be investigated and, and pursued. I'm not sure if it, it sounded like that might be a FERC issue or it might be a DPU issue. I'm not sure, but it's it's, it's an issue that impacts the entire state, uh, especially if they need to go to rolling blackouts. So um, so I, I appreciate your support on sort of uh, continuing to figure out what, what, what the best solution is. Um, and a couple other things that you'll hear probably, you probably heard from every municipality, um, education funding, we would love more of it. Transportation funding, we would love more of it. Charter school tuition reimbursement, we would like more of it. Um, those are all costs that are that are uh, significant in our budgets and that we pay for. Um, so I'm sure you hear those uh, from everywhere. Um, I, I was happy and very supportive of the of the bill to um, help municipalities finance, uh, you know, public buildings, public safety buildings. Um, you know, we have the school building authority, but obviously that's very specific to schools. Um, in any assistance that 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 Waitley could get would be, you know, much appreciated. You know, what's near and dear to our heart. And the reason why we made the suggestion is that we're really at, at a point where we need to replace our highway garage. Um, so the quicker, I don't know if that's gonna be an eligible facility or not as we move forward, but if it is, um, we'll probably probably be first in line. So um, that, would, that, would, that would help. Um, but that's pretty much, about it, I, I second Joyce on uh, on what she said about um, the ability to continue remote meetings. Um, and I know Whaley's not alone with this. We have 
we have difficulties getting people to volunteer for our boards and committees. Um, and anything that we can do to make it easier for people to participate, I think would be a huge help. Um, so I'll step off my soapbox. <laughs> well, uh, the, uh, the town moderator is seconding that as well. He, he's hiding a little bit back there. But... On the Haydenville Road, I just want to say, and I have to say it, you know, Brian, your work on that was so excellent. And really on the legislative side, it was really Natalie um, and Natalie and Corinne. Um, Elaine and I are happy to support this, um, but Natalie and Corinne really led um, and the work has been stellar um, and I'm so glad. And on ISO, man, that was concerning. Um, and I'm sure Natalie did the same. I forwarded that to the TUE leadership on the Senate side and the Senate president and the chair of Ways and Means and, um, and said, look, you know, we have to have an answer for our towns. They can't get a letter saying, you know, without any ability to engage, you may face a blackout and, oh, sorry, get a generator. Um, you know, that can't be, that can't be, that can't stand in my opinion. Um, and I do think, you know, just like we regulated DPU, there's a step that we have to take. I can't tell you what that is right now, um, but um, I, I do think we should engage here to protect if, towns in some way. If getting generators for critical buildings is the answer, even short term, could we get some state help in uh, yeah. procuring those generators? It's a good question. Um, that, that was one of the things that came back to me was, yeah. you know, what do you think about these kinds of fixes? And I said, well, I mean, like, I, I just, I don't think it can be done in email. Um, and we haven't talked about it yet. Um, in person, but I, yeah. we, and could those be solar batteries instead of diesel generators? Right, you know? exactly. Right, all of that, Joyce. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Well, we didn't whine very much, but I'd like <laughs> to give Hannah and, and Amy a chance because they haven't uh, piped in yet. Do you have anything you'd like to add, Hannah or Amy? Um, I think I'd just like to echo the sentiments that um, people have already expressed. I think that these are really valuable issues that um, need attention and renewable energy, especially, and transparency and participation in government are vital. And the more we can um, contribute to that, the better. Thanks, Hannah. Okay. Well, we've kept you for a good, oh, half hour, maybe almost going on 45 minutes here. Is there any last things that you would like to say to us? Uh, just deeply grateful uh, for you taking the time tonight to have this conversation. I think you you all know, you, I think you have our cell phone numbers, you have our email addresses, you know Corinne, you know Elena, and um, we're, we're accessible uh, anytime anything comes to mind in terms of of issues that that you're facing or any challenges or questions. And we just really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you tonight. Joe? Ditto. Ditto, <laughs> Ditto Blay, that's my hashtag, Ditto Blay. <laughs> okay, well, I'll put one of those up for you too, too, as well. What was for dinner, Joyce? Can I ask, was it anything good? Oh, um, yeah, myself. Nat made some, some uh, broccoli and some wings, so. That's dinner. <laughs> He's offering more broccoli, but I can't I was offer say, you. you know, I can come on over. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think there's, there's enough if you're on your way anyways. Yeah, sure. Virtual broccoli. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all so, so much for all you do for the town and your community too. It's. Uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to see us and, and thanks for your hard work as well. Thank you for your right. service. Thank you. We'll talk soon. All right. Bye. 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 Okay. All right. Well, that was very nice, wasn't it? Yep. Let me get, uh, I'm going to stack my computers back up the way they normally are. All right. Um, so we have, I think, just a, a few items left. Okay. Uh, and I think we're on to new business at this point. Um, uh, we need to review and vote to submit a community compact efficiency and regionalization grant application. And I don't know if this goes to Hannah or Brian. That's me. 
Um, so uh, the due date is tomorrow for the um, Community Compact Efficiency and Regionalization Grant. Um, I thought that we could apply to this grant for a plotter for the town of Waitley. We've been receiving a lot of paper plans um, to multiple boards and committees. They're getting built up. Um, and it seems like kind of a small ask, but in terms of overall cost to the town, we'd save about 1.5 hours of staff time per page that needs to be scanned um, and about $37.61 per plan. Um, I think that it would also increase transparency just of operations in general and accessibility, um, make things easier to see, easier to distribute, easier to organize. Mm -hmm. um, so to that end, I'm going to, um, with your uh, blessing, uh, apply for a plotter printer, um, associated supplies, including a roll of printer paper, one set of ink, um, two years of technical support, and then um, two flat file storage cabinets. Um, the total is going to come to $15,210.22. Um, and okay. I'm wondering if we should apply for um, more supplies. That's the only question that I had, and it's mm. a small question, but. I would say more ink. Yeah. You're going to run out of ink yeah. very quickly. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Sounds good. And if I, I, I would fully support this, having been on the planning board, one of their pet peeves problems is inconsistent surveys that come in and plots and designs in different sizes and shapes and colors. And this would help standardize exactly. that. Yeah, I think that it would make operations way more efficient. Um, other municipalities have also expressed interest in sharing this in the future. So we might be able to share costs and um, make this potentially a more regional option, but um, we haven't finalized that yet. Well, do we need a vote on this? Yes, so we need a vote so. to submit the application. Okay, well, I would move then that we submit the application as explained by Hannah. Um, if I can amend that with, with extra ink. Oh, with extra ink. Okay, uh, so moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor, Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, I've got to get this. There we go. Um, we did B under new business already. Uh, on to item C to discuss a letter from the Waitley Capital Improvement Planning Committee requesting that the select board begin the process of planning for a new facility for the highway department which I think there's a bit in our packet, but uh, should I turn this over? Maybe Brian can give us a quick summary for people who are, who are watching. Yeah. So as part of the capital improvement planning process this year uh, for projects for, you know, we're planning for fiscal year 23, um, the capital improvement planning committee had a site visit at the, at the highway garage. Um, and they uh, gave them a tour of the highway garage and looked at the you know, this, the, the condition and status of the equipment. Um, and I think a lot of the members came away with, with the feeling that it's about, well, it's probably past time um, to start the planning process for the highway garage, knowing that it's going to be, you know, probably several years before, you know, we actually get to any, to any point of, uh, of construction. Um, and that was the sentiment of the, of, of the group of, of the committee after that meeting. Um, so there's a just really pretty much a basic letter from the Capital Improvement Planning Committee to the Select Board um, that the CIP, CIPC unanimously voted to recommend the Select Board commence the process of planning for a new highway garage and consider the appointment of a committee to do so. Um, so I, I think one of the first steps is I think I think I need to take uh, do a little bit of research and, and lay out the process again. Um, I think. <clears throat> Um, I think there's going to be some type of similar to what we had to do with the town hall, some type of designer selection process um, based on, you know, the construction costs of the likely construction costs of the um, of the highway garage um, and sort of lay out what those costs will be um, and what that process will be. Um, so, you know, the, the designer selection process for the town hall and, and any designer selection process is, uh, is qualifications based. Um, so we choose our qualifications and then we negotiate price afterwards. Um, so it'll be a, 
it'll be a, a, a couple months process probably by the time we can actually, from when we say go till probably when we award a contract, maybe, maybe three to six months. Um, but first we need to make the decision that it's needed and we want to go forward. And if we're going to go forward with, with sort of what, what committee works best and how many people. Um, mm. So folks have floated around the idea of the municipal building committee. My recollection is that committee is really large. Um, and, I, and I think it would be a little bit too un unwieldy to mm. use that committee. Um, you know, cause, cause uh, I think we try to, you know, pick who we want on these committees based on their expertise, but which I think is good. But at, at the same time, we're going to rely on the, the the designer and the engineer to to really have the expert knowledge as to what we need and, and really what Keith needs. Um, I, I don't. The person who probably knows the most is going is going to be Keith as to what you know what they need for operations. So um, mm -hmm. I don't want to have a committee. I wouldn't recommend a, a committee that's sort of too unwieldy and has you know mm -hmm. thirteen people. I just think that's probably too many. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So it sounds like it would be a little premature to start appointing people to this committee at this point, but that, that's yeah. probably going to be something on another selectman's meeting in the, um, uh, somewhere in the, I don't know, less than one year horizon. It sounds like probably a couple of months. Um, then that sounds completely reasonable. It's just so long as they put electric charging stations in the highway garage. I'm good. I mean, oh, well, you know. Well, that's certainly something that's got to be incorporated. No, no yeah. doubt about it. it. It's coming. And yeah, that's one coming. of the things that, you know, it's it's tough for me. I mean, I have a, a, a good idea on, you know, like space and size that we need. However, one of the things that I don't have the expertise is, you know, when it comes to like building code, you know, I may say I want to do this and then uh, building code says no you that's not big enough or that is not allowed anymore that kind of thing and that's why we need outside yeah. firm that deals with this on a regular basis to be giving us that input yeah i i we do need someone to give us the technical uh requirements and you know what we need to do but i think we need to provide them with what you know those dimensions mm. and features that you would like in a perfect world to see. You know, not necessarily, you know, the, you know, a massive or uh, <laughs> overstock thing that, right. you know, not, not, we don't need a Taj Mahal. We, we don't need a Taj mm -hmm. Mahal as we may we have don't? seen in other local communities, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or maybe even you know, three different tiers of, you know, bare minimum, reasonable, and wish list that, mm -hmm. you know, could be presented to give us yeah. an idea of what each would, you know, well, even ballpark what each would cost. Because right now we're flying blind mm -hmm. on what, what we need would cost. Correct. Right. Okay. So it sounds like we kind of have a consensus that this should move forward. Brian, sounds like a next step would be to kind of figure out the process a little bit better and keep in mind, maybe we want rather than a 13 person committee, maybe a, a five person committee or a seven person committee, maybe at most. Um, and, uh, and that this is, this is well, somewhere in the letter, they, they kind of talked about a time frame. Um, several years to go through the design and construction process. So several is a little vague, but um, I it, we should get it started. And um, do we need a vote to say we want to get this started? No, I just I just want some direction as to it's mm -hmm. time to start it. So let's okay. Let's start. Right. I, I would just say it's long past time we started, but it's a good thing we are. <laughs> okay. Oh, we started this before, didn't we? No, just kidding. Um, all right, item D, we took care of earlier. Um, item E, to discuss a request to hold a special town meeting before April 1st, 2022. And I'm sympathetic to it because it sounds like it'll save us interest payments. Um, and interest rates are, we know which way they're going these days. 
Um, but uh, maybe somebody can summarize the reason why we might want to do this sooner rather than later. Um, yep. Would that be yours, Brian? Yep. Um, so, so as everyone knows, there was a, a CPA backed loan that that helped finance the town hall historic rehabilitation project, and um, we've been paying the towns been paying that off year by year. Um, so there's around there's approximately a hundred fifty nine thousand hundred sixty thousand dollars left um, remaining on that on that uh, CPA backed loan. Uh, the next payment is due. Um, so we've been doing a, a, a series of one year notes for the borrowing. Um, so the next payment is due April 15th. Um, and the CPC has voted to recommend that um, and ask for the for the select board to call a special town meeting um, prior to the next payment being due so they could pay off that, that loan um, in total. So that's the request is that there would be a special town meeting. Uh, maybe there would be a handful of other articles that 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 we may consider. Um, I'd have to think about that. Um, check my notes. Um, so it, it, ideally, it would be before April first, so we have time to process the process the payment and the warrant. Um, so that's the recommendation. Currently, um, it would need to be in person. Um, mm -hmm. So it would be outside or cold, outside and cold, or maybe warm. It's been warm lately, um, or we would to find a larger yeah. maybe a larger space to hold it indoors um i'm not really sure which way to go on that yeah. but well, i understand we'd, um we'd have to do this before april 1st um and i know there's a timeline of notification and, uh, and so on um what's the earliest we could do a special town meeting so um we would need to draft the, so it's 14 days uh posting um mm -hmm. and the board would need to to meet and uh, sign the warrant. So 14 days from, I mean, if we're just doing a single article, it, I mean, we could, we could have a meeting next week and sign it. Um, mm. it is, and then we would have it. We would be looking at the beginning of March, right? Um, so early March. Okay. So, so we could be ready by early March. And uh, so more or less any time in March, really, then it sounds like. Yeah. Um, and I get, guess then we need to just sort out. Is there any reason to go earlier rather than later? And if we go later, there might be other things that come up that we would want to include. Yeah. That... Yeah. So, you know, thinking about our, our previous discussion in what Fred just said, maybe things do come up if we're going to move the if we're considering moving the the annual to sometime in early june i think is what we were is what was being discussed right mm -hmm. yeah. um it would space it out a little bit um yeah so i i don't really know of anything that's pressing right now that we would need a special town meeting for other than other than this mm -hmm. okay well but it is there any urgency to have it? No. Yeah, it doesn't sound with, like with any any time before April first. Right. <clears throat> um, I don't think so. Well, then let's kind of go on the idea that there'll be this one article. I'm guessing by the time we get to our next meeting, that may have changed. You may have come up with some other things. So at our next meeting, we may or may not have um, a special town meeting. Um, warrant to look at and approve and yeah. then sort out some dates for it um and maybe offline um i have a very i have a few days where i'm traveling that month um with the town moderator <laughs> so um maybe uh that you can get right a heads up about uh, what dates are impossible um yeah. but the, i i think there's um uh, probably his schedule is the trickiest one. Um, I think later March will work better for him. But okay. uh, you, that can be that can be offline. Okay. Okay. All right. So you don't you don't need a vote on this at this moment, <clears throat> but we we have a heads up now that this is coming. 
Yep. And we'll try for late March. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. Now I get to turn over Brian for town administrator updates. <clears throat> yep. Just this is a, a quick confirmation question. Um, so we currently received an application to transfer the licenses at Castaways. Um, and we're looking to call the hearing for the next select board meeting, which would be February 23rd. And just want to make sure that we'll have a quorum. There. I, I, be, I believe I intend be to be there. Okay. All right. And I'll reach out to Jonathan as well. Um, I'll send out, you know, I'll send out the materials uh, well in advance so uh, the board has a chance to look at those. This, this um, is for transfer to a new owner? So this is a transfer. This is a transfer of the liquor license to a new owner. And um, the adult entertainment license, when it was issued, um, is, is technically non-transferable. So it, it'll be a new application for an entertainment license. Um, it okay. is what is what the board has in front of it or will have in front of it um, do we know if the if it has been sold already or if the sale is pending i i don't know exactly okay we'll find out then <clears throat> we will yeah um new south county senior center director um is jennifer remillard um she was appointed um at the end of january um, so if folks are involved in the, the senior center, they should, uh, get to know Jen. Um, and last but not well, least, before you, will she be presenting to the finance committee select board, the senior center budget? Yeah, she will be attending that. Yep. Along with our the board of oversight member, I anticipate will be there. Um, and then um, channel 15, the bulletin board, as I can look at it now, um, is up and running. It's been dormant for a while. Um, so if anybody um, wants to find out more information about uh, the town and the region, they can turn to channel 15 if they have uh, cable, of course, Comcast cable. Um, but that's about all I have. Okay. Are there any um, items not anticipated? Our meeting next meeting are the twenty third and March 9th. Yep, to this. Looks like. Yep. Okay. I will move to adjourn. I'll second that. Uh, all in favor, Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks for all your hard work. Good night. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.